which attack on the diseases caused by fungi, bacteria, viruses, and so on. And again, coming to diseases, the soil-borne pathogens are more difficult compared to controlling the aerial-borne pathogens, which are found on the leaves or in the stem. It's much easier. But this pathogen comes from the soil. It's much more difficult. I'll just go through some of these studies that have been made. Uh, here are the it's a various crops here on the left side. Let us take one example of pigeon pea. Pigeon pea is red gram. And the, when we take pigeon pea, pea as the example, the major disease in red gram is the wilt disease caused by physarium odum. And the experiments research done so far shows the best biocontrol agent to control this disease is the fungus trichoderma viridae. Similarly, take chickpea or the Bengal gram and for the wilt disease, trichoderma arzianum. And if we just go through this biocontrol agent list, you can see trichoderma dominates. So the best biocontrol agent for controlling many of the plant disease is trichoderma. Now, again, which is mass produced and it's available in the market for a farmer to go and buy. I've just shown once a triplet showing how we test the antagonistic activity of an organism. And in and around Bangalore, nematodes are becoming a serious problem, especially on a variety of crops, vegetables, pulses, fruit crops, plantation crops, oil seeds, and so on. And these root knot nematodes, mainly Meridagain incognita and Melanagain javanica are the two species in, in and around Bangalore. And it has become very difficult to grow any solanaceous crop without the attack of these nematodes. It has become that serious. And so there are organisms which can control these nematodes and uh, and the ones which are the best now are the Pesilomyces lilacinus, a fungus, and Poconia clematosporia. These two fungi are very effective in controlling the root knot nematodes. And again, it is not available in a large scale in the market. And it is, if you want, you can write to your contact a agricultural university or a research station. They will be able to provide you this particular fungi for the biocontrol of root knot nematodes. And here again, coming to the insect pests, okay? And how can the microbes help with the controlling insect pests? In cotton, again, we know the caterpillar pest, gold worm, and the best biocontrol agent, all of us know, Bacillus thuringiensis. And you know, the Bt gene is now incorporated. Bt cotton is also available. And other, another important disease, uh, I mean, uh, pest is in potato and coffee, we have the codling moth and potato beetle. And here the best biocontrol agent is the fungus, Bavaria bassiana. Again, in coconut, leaf hoppers and beetles, the best control, biocontrol agent is Metarhesium anisofliae, which is again a fungus. And again, in cotton bowl worms, we have the nuclear polyhedrosis virus, which is very, very effective in the biocontrol of, uh, of this pest. I've just shown the culture of Bacillus uh, thuringiensis in the petri plate and also uh, larva, which is infected with Bacillus thuringiensis and which is dead, a dead larva. And again, just to show you Bavaria bassiana, <coughs> It is called as white muscardine fungus. Just by looking at the insect which is diseased, you can make out white is called as white muscardine fungus because it covers the insect with a nice white colored fungal growth. And this is Metarhesium anisofriae attacking various insects, including grasshoppers, and it is called as green muscardine disease or fungus. So you can see this. The whole insect has turned covered as green because of the conidia that is produced by the fungus. And the, here again, we have some virus, as I told, nuclear polyhydrosis virus, which is very effective in controlling certain insect pests. And there are two major insect pests in our country. One is Helicoverpa armigera, 
Another one is Spodoptera litura, which attacks a variety of crop plants. So these are considered as the two major pests. And again, nuclear polyhydrosis virus is best in controlling these two insect uh, pests. And how do we know it is uh, the insect that is dead in the in the in, in the field is killed by nuclear polyhydrosis virus? It's very simple. What happens? The infected larva goes to the top of the plant. Okay, even if it's a small tree, it can go to the top and then hangs upside upside down, head down, tail up, and dies. So by looking at it, you can guess that it is being attacked by nuclear polyhydrosis virus before you can do any electron microscopy studies. Okay. Another area where microbiologists have started, looked into is microorganisms for the biocontrol of weeds. I'm so sorry to say that till today, we do not have one good biocontrol agent for controlling weeds. So several projects have gone, a lot of money has been spent, but till today we do not have a potential microbe to control weeds. One particular microbe, a rust fungus, Paxinia spezageni, showed some hope of controlling a particular weed called Mechania bicranta, and uh, which occurs in plantation crops like tea, coffee, and so on. And so the earlier work was done in Cabby in England, and later it was transferred to NBPCR in New Delhi. All initial studies were done, and because it should not attack any crop plant, it should be very specific to the weed. And so initial studies were done, and it was released to two states in our country, Kerala and Assam. And those people used it in their plantations, and Kerala said it is not working. And Assam said first year, there was some hope. Second year, it did not work. So that's why we say I say that today we do not have any micro which can be used effect as an effective biocontrol for weeds. And this is Mechania micranta weed, and this is its Paxinia spezangini. Now, having told so much about agriculture, let us come to change the topic and come to food. How microbes are useful in food? Okay, what do we have in the morning most of the time? Idli or dosa. <laughs> and we know that the mother makes the batter and leaves it overnight. And she won't make the dosa immediately or the idli immediately. So what happens during this overnight fermentation? The lactic acid bacteria develop. So in Italy, the, the one which the most is the leuconostoc mesenteroides, so that we get the soft idli next morning. Similarly, we go to the shop and buy the bread or bun. Again, we know for the duck to raise, what is needed is the yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And again, for yogurt or curd, you know what the mother does? Lukewarm milk, she adds the little starter curd of the previous day. So next day morning, you have a nice curd. So again, lactic acid bacteria, Lactobacillus bulgaricus, Streptococcus thermophilus are all involved. Similarly, for cheese, soy sauce, tempeh, vinegar, all the different organisms are involved in the fermentation. Similarly, for beer, production of beer from malt, Saccharomyces cerevisiae is involved. And for wine fermentation from grape juice, Saccharomyces ellipsoides is involved. You may be wondering why I am including this as food. As per the international classification, wine and beer are included as food. <laughs> okay, this is coming to aquaculture. In Andhra Pradesh, aquaculture, many farmers thrive on aquaculture. So they had a problem in raising fish as well as shrimps. It was mostly in shrimp farming they found that there was many of the shrimps were dying. Again, when they approached us, we said, we have never worked in aquaculture, so I do not know what, how to, we can help you. Then they themselves said, sir, there is something called probiotics, people say. Can you help us with some probiotic, which will not completely take away the disease problem, 
but at least reduce the disease problem. So it was a new thing for us. So we developed a probiotic consisting of four organisms. It was a trial and error method. Uh, we took a lactic acid, acidophilus, nitrobacter, bifidobacterium, and saccharomyces and gave it to them. And that was added to the aquaculture, uh, the, uh, the aquatic forms. And they said it reduced the disease incidence. So very good. So we were happy at least what we tried roughly has worked in reducing the disease incidence. Coming to microbes in industry, and again, we know that they are useful in various ways. I'll go into each one of them a little later. And here we can say for the production, industrial production of organic acids, we use various, various microbes are used. You know, for acid, acetic acid production, the organism that is used is acetobacter and the substrate is sugarcane juice. Again, for producing lactic acid, lactobacillus crookii and lactobacillus bulgaricus are used with using different substrates. Whey is used in the former, glucose in the latter. And similarly, the way industrially, amine, for the production of amino acids, various or organisms are used. For alanine production, the organism that is used is microbacterium aminophilum. And for lysine, the organism used is brevibacterium flavor. Similarly, for glutamic acid, it is micrococcus glutamicus. So we know for a production, industrial production of amino acids, different microbes are used. Similarly, for production of enzymes, for, en for amylase, the organism that is used is Bacillus subtilis. For lipases, the organism that is used is Penicillium chrysogenum. And vitamins, again, for the production of vitamin B12, two organisms are used, either Pseudomonas denitrificans or Propionobacterium spirmani. And for the production of rib riboflavin, the fungus Ashbia gossypii is used industrially. And antibiotics, all, thing, I, all of you know the story of penicillin discovered, uh, discovery, and that was the first antibiotic that was discovered. And you can see that now we have varieties of antibiotics. You can just go to a shop and buy any antibiotic you want. And many people don't realize that it has come from a microbe. And we know streptomycin comes from streptomyces griseus, bacitracin from bacillus glyconiformis, vitomycin from streptomyces antibioticus, and so on. And coming to <clears throat> paper industry, all of us use paper. I'm sure that some of you must be using paper now also writing something. And in paper industry, again, a microbe is used for pulping for the, the wooden chips. And that is the fungus, Peridocete chrysosporium. So many, we all use paper day in and day out without knowing a microbes involved in the manufacture of paper. And similarly, in retting of flax, tanning of leather, sewage treatment, various microbes are used. And for extraction of copper from copper ores, again, a bacterium is used, thiobacillus peroxidans, and is used for the extraction of copper, which is cost effective and less polluting. And coming to genetically application of genetically engineered microbes, let us take a couple of examples and see how it is useful. You know, glyphosate is a weedicide for controlling weeds. This is applied. But there are some crops which are sensitive to this particular weedicide. Glyphosate cannot be used in tobacco field because it will kill tobacco plants also. And we know some bacteria are resistant to glyphosate. What the biotechnologists have done? They have taken this gene for resistance from the bacterium and introduced into the tobacco plant through protoplast fusion. Now we have glyphosate resistant tobacco. And now glyphosate can be used in that such tobacco fields. And, <laughs> and similarly, Bacillus thuringiensis, and we know it produces the toxin, and, and which is toxin to Lepidopterous insects. And when we grow cotton, 
there is a problem of black cut worms in cotton which feed on the roots of cotton so what the biotechnologists have done they have transferred this toxic producing toxin producing gene from bacillus thuringiensis to pseudomonas fluorescens which is a pgpr and this pgpr is used for coating the seeds cotton seeds and they are sown so pseudomonas fluorescens colonizes the rhizosphere and this black cutworm without knowing that comes and feeds on the root what happens he also feeds on pseudomonas fluorescens which has the gene which can kill them so it dies so this is another very classical work that has been done by biotechnologists again okay. coming to industry we know when we talk of alcohol production in industry we always think of yeast but there is also a bacterium which can be used for production of alcohol which is zymomonas mobilis the the problem with this bacterium earlier was it cannot use a cheaper source of substrate like cellulose it could use only glucose but it becomes very costly in a foreign industry so later on what was done the cellulase genes from cellulomonas was introduced into zymomonas mobilis okay now zymomonas mobilis can grow on cellulose and thereby made the alcohol production cheaper okay this is another classical examples similarly antibiotics organic acids enzymes are all can be produced through genetically altered organisms coming to environmental protection genes from certain bacteria isolated from waste sites have been introduced to the normal bacteria which degrade organic matter thereby they degrade the xenobiotics and toxic waste which applies go good even for the pesticides so with they can degrade pesticides much faster than the normal organism can degrade coming to nanotechnology so we are in the period of nanotechnology now so <clears throat> people were try, earlier trying uh, producing nanoparticles using plants now they are turning to microbes because it is much cheaper and it can be produced in shorter time compared to using plants so it has where these nanoparticles have great significance and they are these nanoparticles are used for rapid diagnosis of diseases development of vaccines control of environmental pollution preservation of food some some of these are also used as antimicrobial agents and biocides so now lot of attraction is there using microbes for the production of nanoparticles which can be used in various areas which i just now said finally coming to biodiversity having said so much about beneficial use of microorganisms and the recent trends in microbiology and biotechnology if we ask ourselves a question how much we know about the microbes existing in nature the answer is very little okay that is the answer we can give why even though the work started with uh, louis pasteur we have spent almost 160 to 70 year 170 years now lot of research has been done on microbiology and now if we ask the question how much of what percentage of microbes existing in nature do we know the answer is 3% we know only 3% of the microbial species existing in nature okay the diversity the the, the biodiversity is given lot of importance nowadays globally united nations fao all are giving lot of importance at biodiversity okay it i when i say biodiversity it's just not microbes it includes plants and animals also so it is our duty to know more about this diversity which we do not know now and to go into and then uh, look for this newer 
biodiversity, they rarely exist, conserve them and screen them for the newer bioactive molecules, which will be of use to mankind. That is the approach. Now the question is, I said, we do not know 97% of the microbes existing in nature. We know only 3%. Where do the 95% hiding? Where are they present? Why we are not able to get them? The committee, uh, the global committee has suggested the some environments where they may be present and to look for the microbes in from these areas where you will get the, the chances of getting new microbes or more. What they have suggested? Hypersaline lakes and soils, thermal environments, including hot deserts, mangroves, swamps, and brackish waters, salt marshes, beaches, and estuaries, surface, intestines, fecal matter, and nests of insects and animals, surface of plants growing under extreme environments. Uh, that is what we just, uh, that some work is being going on on these archaeas. The, and ocean floors, environment saturated with sewage effluents and pollutants. So these are the areas where we can look for newer microbes. But at this stage, I would like to add that government of India has recognized at least one of this area for funding. That is the surface intestines and fecal matter and nests of insects. So if somebody is interested in applying for a funding, this is one area where Government of India funding is now available for looking into new year microbes. Okay, so when we look for these new microbes, what happens? Okay, before coming to that, let me see that. So you, you may, there are chance that when you, you may isolate a new microbe, so what type of micro? It may be producing a new antibiotic. Maybe some other enzyme which is not known, not known so far. Or it may be a better nitrogen fixer, which we do not know. So you get all the credit for having discovered something new. So it may be not only do not stop with the isolating and then discovering a new micro, but Go one step further, bioprospect it for see what is the use, how it can be useful to mankind. As I said earlier, it could be a better industrially important or agriculturally important or in food industry, whatever it is. So just look how it is useful to mankind. So with this, I'm sure the younger people here will have a lot of scope to look for newer organisms and then see the, how it is useful to mankind. I'll just give you one example, just to motivate you. We know that a lot of nitrogen is present in the atmosphere, as I told uh, earlier, and plants cannot directly use them. And certain microbes, only bacteria like rhizobium can fix it. So, which is called nitrogen fixation. So atmospheric nitrogen, is fixed by the nitrogen fixing bacteria, which is the form of nitrogen it is fixing. It is fixing it in the form of ammonical form. But again, plants cannot prefer to use ammonical form of nitrogen. They prefer nitrate form of nitrogen. Okay, plants take nitrate form of nitrogen and not ammonical form. So there are two other bacteria in soil which convert ammonical form of nitrogen to nitrite. It's a two-step process. First, ammonia to nitrite, then nitrite to nitrate. So, nitrosomonas converts it to nitrite, and this NO2 is converted by another bacterium, nitrobacter, to nitrate. So, oxidation of ammonia to nitrate is a two-step process which we have been taught all these years till today all the books only tell this okay now very recently a scientist from usa university of maryland found a new bacterium okay and he named it as nitrospira 
what is the advantage how it has done what job it has done it has converted ammonia directly in one step to nitrate so the two step has gone now this bacterium can convert ammonical form of nitrogen to nitrate form for which he got lot of applause academic recognitions so this will hold good to you people young people here also go for your organisms and then look what it can do so you will come up with new findings which will bring you lot of credit so i wish all of you success in your endeavors thank you very much Thank you, sir, for your very insightful, uh, very insightful talk on how microbi um, uh, microbes are useful uh, to humankind, sir. Um, if there is any doubts with anybody, can you please raise? I will chat uh, in the chat box. Do we have a latent mycobacterium in our lungs so that coronavirus? <laughs> uh, there is one question which I cannot answer. <laughs> I think you should have asked Dr. Deepshika. <laughs> Okay, she would have given the right answer. I have I've been, I'm more an agricultural microbiologist, yeah. No other questions? So that does it mean that everything is very clear? So there is one more question on nitrospira, sir. Pardon? There is one more uh, question raised in the chat. Uh, something more on nitrospira. Nitrospira. Yeah, I told that it is this particular bacterium can uh, convert ammonical form of nitrogen directly into nitrate form instead of two steps. Earlier, we used to talk of two different organisms, uh, ammonia to nitrite by nitrosomonas, later by ni uh, nitrite to nitrate by nitrobacter. But nitrospira can do this two steps and one step. That is, ammonical form is directly converted to a nitrate form, which is a very recent report. Good afternoon, sir. I'm uh, Darshan this side. Sir, are there any uh, microbiome studies conducted on uh, agricultural plants? Microbiome studies, sir? Conducted on agricultural plants? Uh, microbiome studies, people have just initiated, not the entire plant as such, certain parts of the plant, yeah. Very recently, people are started doing it, yeah.
Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for sharing your knowledge with us. The lecture was very interesting and we learned a lot from it. I now request Oishik Bhattacharya to introduce the fourth speaker for the day. Thank you, sir. 